The equine species has evolved naturally, anatomically and behaviourally over the past 55 million years, allowing the horse to become an extremely effective species at survival. Whilst evidence shows that the history of domestication of the horse began around 3000 BC, the equine industry has boomed and over the past 400 years high quantities of selective breeding have resulted in a huge genetic variation of breeds with different morphological types. The appearance of the equine species is extremely broad and today horses' working roles range from entertainment to vital requirements in day-to-day -day life, such as police horses patrolling the streets, race horses and showing Shetlands. The highly specialised evolution of the horse has resulted in many physiological adaptations which in turn allow for excellent movement of the horse, such as lengthening of the distal limbs as well as progressive reduction in the quantity of toes from 5 to 1. A combination of these evolutionary traits and selective breeding has resulted in the horse being an outstanding power generator, having the ability to produce speeds of up to 48 km per hour. When looking at the generic locomotion of the domesticated horse, it can be classified into four gates walk, chop, canter, and gallop. Walk is a four beat gait which has a large overlap between the stance phase of each limb. It also lacks a period of suspension. This is the most stable gait, and for a horse, it is their default gait. This is due to them being a prey animal where their main focus is to retain energy to allow them to reach faster gaits when in a dangerous situation. Trot is a two-beat, symmetrical and diagonal gait, where there are four different varieties, including collected, working, medium and extended trot, where the speed of the gait is varied as well as the stride length, the longest stride length being in the extended trot and the shortest in the collected trot. Canter is a three-beat gait, where the stance phases of the diagonal pair of limbs is synchronised. It's an asymmetrical gait, as the limb patterns alter depending on the direction of travel and which lead the horse is on. The pattern of canter consists of hind limb, opposite hind limb and its front diagonal at the same time, followed by the final front limb while suspension occurs. It's a smooth gait, which is energy conserving. This is surprising considering the speed of this gait. Gallop is a four beat gait and at severely increased speed than that of walk with an added suspension stage. The footfalls of the diagonal pairs are disassociated as in the leading hind limb contacting the ground before the trailing forelimb. When looking at the displacement values between gates, it is interesting to view that the lateral displacement for a 500 kg horse decreases from 50 mm during a slow walk to only a few millimetres during a high speed gallop. Whereas, when looking at the vertical displacement, it is visible that it more than doubles when the horse passes from a working trot to a gallop. Horses have adapted to have extremely long legs in comparison to their overall body size. And with no muscle at all in the distal section of their limb, the lightweight lower limb is able to be thrown forward using force rather than using energy. This in turn decreases the overall amount of energy needed to perform each stride. The horse's tendons play a major part in their capability. With the tendons running down the back of the distal part of the limb as being extremely strong, they are able to act as a shock absorber during the landing section of the jump. Tendons such as these are up to 93% efficient, using only 7% of the energy that's stored. As previously mentioned, selective breeding has resulted in a large variety of roles appearing within the equine industry. One that has become increasingly popular is show jumping. It has occurred annually in the World Olympics since 1912. Show jumping is a complex anatomical movement for horses, resulting in large forces being transferred through each limb during the different stages of the gait. In order for an accurate jump to take place, the horse needs to raise its centre of mass so that all four limbs are able to clear the height and width of the obstacle. The physical anatomy of horses means that they are able to jump from all gates and even from standstill. However, when looking at these gates used in competition, canter and gallop are the most common. The gait of the actual jump is associated with one gallop stride in which the suspension phase is a long dissociation of the diagonal. Interestingly, it's been shown that by adulthood, horses have a consistent biomechanical pattern during jumping. To produce a good jump, horse and rider have to work in synergy to control balance during the dynamic equilibrium changes that occur throughout the phases of the jump. A study by Hull provides a good example of how data from top level competition can be used within performance analysis, utilising footage from Olympic show jumping. 
From this study, it can be seen that the approach strides are used by the horse to prepare for the jump, whilst the landing strides are used to rebalance and promote forward momentum within the intermediate strides, observed in combinations needing to fulfil both of these roles. It has been shown that vertical velocity increases with the fence height and is significantly correlated with fence height in successful horses. The vertical component in takeoff differentiates clearly at the different type of obstacles, with the broader the jump, the smaller the vertical part in takeoff. In the first 40% of ground time, work of muscles is negative and the horizontal acceleration of the approach is reduced. When looking at the anatomical effects of show jumping, it is important to consider that the basic training of top show jumpers will begin at the age of three, at which point the bone development is not fully complete. A horse is not physiologically mature until it is between five and six years of age, and because of the small quantity of blood supply to the bone, the physiological response to training is much slower, usually taking around two years, in which time the bone mineral density increases, helping to inhibit fractures from occurring. Whilst the skeletal structures of the horse are placed under great forces, the tendons also take large amounts of pressure off of the horse's anatomy. During show jumping, the main tendons placed under large forces are the deep digital flexor and the superficial digital flexor tendon. These tendons come under the fetlock and during takeoff and landing, they are stretched to full capacity, holding large amounts of elastical energy, therefore preventing breaks from occurring. Through training, the stretch capacity of these tendons are increased, allowing for greater propulsion forces. During the approach stage of a jump, the horse will commonly decrease its velocity, with studies showing that the lower the velocity during approach, the more successful the jump. The approach stride will commonly be a short, fast, four-beat stride with a decreased stride length. During the takeoff, the hind limb stance phases have increased synchronisation compared to a regular gallop stride. This allows more power to be created and therefore results in a strong takeoff. Studies show that the hind limb provides a forward and upwards propulsion. The hind limbs also have decreased distance in between them during the takeoff phase when compared to a regular canter or gallop stride. Anatomically, 85% of the power during takeoff is produced at the stifle. This allows the potential energy increase at the centre of mass. A study by Chiefy and DeMello found that when all horses approached the jump in a moderately fast gallop, 68% of the time they began and finished the jump on the same lead limb. In the other 32% of times, horses changed lead. It's been shown that these changes are made whilst the horse is in suspension and may be precipitated by asymmetries of twisting evoked during the takeoff phase. In the stride directly prior to the suspension phase of the jump, the front limbs act as rigid struts which initiate elevation of the forequarters and a change in the trajectory of the centre of mass of the body prior to the hind limbs coming into contact with the ground. Whilst the duration of the stance phase of the lead and trailing forelimbs don't have a significant difference, the leading forelimb has a longer quantity of time in singular support. A study in the Equine Veterinary Journal looked at the kinematics of the horse during the takeoff stage of the jump. During the first section of the jump, the trunk was notably rotated dorsally, increasing the centre of mass by 0.05 metres. As well as this, 25 degrees of hip extension and 40 degrees of flexion in the stifle and hock joints were recorded. Maximal flexion of the tarsal joint was recorded at 98 milliseconds after ground contact, with maximal flexion of the stifle joint recorded at 124 milliseconds after ground contact. The hip was then recorded to extend until 152 milliseconds. The average mechanical power recorded during the takeoff stage of the jump being 59,000 watts. During the jump phase, the hind limbs have a closer proximity to the jump than the forelimbs. They also have a significantly different angle of approach to the ground than the forelimbs, with the average angle for the forelimbs being 53.5 degrees and the hind limbs 47.4 degrees. This action allows the horse to have increased symmetry and balance, in turn allowing for the hind limbs to be raised in unison after takeoff. During the suspension phase of the jump, the angular velocity of the trunk should remain the same. During landing, the footfalls of the forelimbs have no synchronisation. The gait pattern in the landing phase consists of lead forelimb, then trailing forelimb, followed by the hind limbs. The trailing forelimb is shown to be close to vertical when making contact with the ground, which means that extremely high force is placed through this limb. 
Through force plate investigations, it can be proven that the ground reaction forces of the forelimb are significantly higher during the landing stage of the jump compared to the takeoff stage. Forces of nearly double the body weight have been recorded when jumping over a 1.1 metre vertical fence. As well as high ground reaction forces during impact with the ground, the forelimbs also show high levels of metacarpal hyperextension. The centre of gravity is increased based on the upright position of the trunk. As the fence height is increased, the successful horses adapt their position to a more upright body by decreasing the distance between the leading higher tube and centre of gravity. In several studies, it has been shown that the trailing forelimb appears to raise the centre of mass of the body, with the leading forelimb providing a break for the vertical acceleration of the jump. A study by Clayton and Barlow looked at the stride statistics of the horse during each phase of the jump. Through this, it was discovered that the fastest stride was the approach stride, with an average of 7.3 metres per second. This study also showed that the trailing forelimb had the longest stance phases during the departure stride, which supports evidence that it has the highest amount of forces placed for it. It has been shown that the greater the speed, the greater the stress forces on the limbs. However, studies show that due to bending, stress forces in the tibia were significantly higher of around 45% than in the metatarsus over the range of speeds. Bending of the tibia resulted from significant off-axis loading by the ground reaction force. On the other hand, the metatarsus loaded in compression because of its close alignment with the ground reaction force. The peak forces recorded whilst the horses were in canter were 53 MPA in the caudal cortex of the tibia and 38 MPA in the plantar cortex of metatarsus. In both the tibia and metatarsus, the forces transpired were greater during jumping and acceleration than during a steady gait at any speed, as shown by a study which deduced that the peak forces recorded whilst jumping were 126 MPA in the cranial cortex of the tibia and 117 MPA in the dorsal cortex of metatarsus. When investigating the kinematic changes that occur whilst the horse is jumping, it has been shown that there is an increase in the stance phase percentage, an increase in maximum extension, as well as an increase in the range of motion of the fetlock joint in the forelimb when comparing it to that of a regular gallop stride. During the stage of takeoff and landing, the horse is highly subjected to an increase of biomechanical loading. This, in turn, causes an increased risk of general pain in the hip, as well as pain in the deep digital flex tendon and the suspensory ligament injury. A study in the American Journal of Veterinary Research looked at the ground reaction force patterns in all limbs at takeoff and landing in a total of five Dutch warm bloods which jumped a 0.8 metre vertical fence on the right canter lead. The distribution of the ground reaction forces and force impulses on the forelimbs during takeoff and landing were considerably different from those recorded during normal canter. During the takeoff stage, the propulsory ground reaction forces of the hind limbs were recorded at three to five times higher than those recorded at a normal canter. When looking at the propulsory ground reaction forces during landing, the trailing forelimb and both hind limbs had the highest recorded increase. However, the vertical ground reaction force amplitudes and the force impulses had a similarity in magnitude to those recorded at canter. It was discovered that the trail and forelimb had the highest recorded loads of up to twice the horse's body weight, with the higher fences causing the higher ground reaction forces. A study by Powers and Kamana looked at the effect of the rider on the jumping kinematics of a horse. Whilst the philosophy has always been that the rider plays a large role on the horse's jump, this study showed that there were no significant differences in the horse's kinematics when jumped by a novice rider and an experienced rider. Overall, it is clear that horses have numerous adaptations allowing them to be successful at jumping as well as being efficient in their everyday locomotion. Jumping is a sport that puts increased forces on the limbs compared to normal locomotion, making injury more likely. However, by training show jumping horses from a young age, chances of injuries are reduced. This is due to the fact that it allows their bones to adapt and remodel in response to the forces applied to the limbs, which can sometimes be up to twice the horse's body weight.